Right. This is the panel with people with difficult names. Uh, <laughs> so, so I'm Andrew Fracknoy, and uh, uh, I'm sorry to report that Dennis Schatz has had a family uh, medical emergency. And so I'm actually going to be presenting both uh, his slides and my slides in sort of one session. Um, I, as as um, you may know, some of you, I've been with the Eclipse Task Force since the 2017 eclipse. I'm a retired astronomer and college professor. I write textbooks, children's books, and even in my retirement, science fiction stories, uh, including one I'm trying to get published about eclipses. But that's another story for another time. So uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about eclipse outreach and eclipse education. We can't do justice to either of those topics in eight minutes each but uh, we'll try to highlight some of the things that Dennis and I are doing and also some of the projects that other people are uh, involved with as well. Uh, the next slide. Uh, so this is, oh, okay. So um, this is the crucial piece of information that motivates and scares the heck out of us. Uh, if you ask not just who's going to see the wonderful total eclipse, but who's going to see any kind of eclipse in the next school year? Uh, we're talking about 500 million people. And the next slide shows you a typical educator uh, realizing these numbers and contemplating what they mean. Now, appropriately there in San Antonio, you guys are focusing on the wonders and glory of the total eclipse that's coming, and that's great. But you have to remember that most people in the North American continent will see a partial eclipse. And it's up to us as educators to make sure that they don't feel left out and that they don't feel like second class citizens. Even if in your heart you believe that the only true religious experience is the total eclipse, we have to make sure that everyone feels included. The next slide shows you how we've been thinking about this since the 2017 eclipse. We realized before that eclipse that if we're going to try to distribute information to a lot of people, many communities already have an information distribution center built in, which is their public library. And so we, in, in anticipation of 2017, approached the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation um, and uh, they uh, very kindly worked with us to try to distribute several million eclipse glasses and information packets through several thousand public libraries. And that worked so well that for the upcoming two eclipses, we've asked them to uh, do even better. And the next slide shows you what's happening. Uh, the Fort Moore Foundation, working with the Space Science Institute in Boulder, Colorado, as the responsible agency, funded 5 million eclipse glasses. And the National Science Foundation was so impressed, they kicked in it enough money for an extra 1 million. So we are now having 6 million glasses and information distributed free through more than 13,000 public libraries nationwide. And we're extremely gratified by the response we've received. Almost 5 million glasses are now in the libraries, and the 13,000 includes libraries and library branches all over the United States. The next slide shows you the booklet uh, that Dennis and I have put together uh, for the libraries, which includes take-home sheets that they can send in both English and Spanish. And if you are working uh, with outreach and would like to have a copy of this, which is really an introduction to how to do public outreach and especially how to do safe observing when the glasses run out, uh, the short URL is bit.ly forward slash eclipses for libraries. Uh, this is really uh, um, uh, free to everyone and available uh, for you to use, uh, for you to copy there are no copyright issues at all. The next slide. Uh, in addition, this grant also provides workshops and lendable kits of solar telescopes and activities about the sun to all the state library systems and all the territorial library systems in the United States. 
uh, the folks at the Space Science Institute have already done 48 workshops in person, most of them for 1300 librarians. And the nice thing about these kits is that they will stay with the library systems long after memories of the eclipse themselves fade, the eclipses themselves fade. Next slide. Now, 13,000 libraries with librarians, most of whom do not have a science background, we clearly need help. And a lot of our effort has been and many of you have participated, including Angela, who is our star pupil. Um, we need help from others who can uh, assist and support the libraries. The next slide shows you some of what's going on. We're training several hundred Eclipse experts to help libraries in their community and in other communities, especially small rural communities that don't have an astronomer nearby. These experts include professional astronomers, uh, science educators, amateur astronomers, park rangers, everyone who knows enough about eclipses to assist the local library. And we still have room for many other eclipse experts before April, so don't hesitate uh, to sign up. The next slide shows you some of what's going on. Those uh, experts who have students We've encouraged them to have their students become secret agents for eclipses and provide information for their schools and their communities uh, through social media, which the students often know a lot better uh, than we older folks. And uh, we'll see that several uh, schools have set up special eclipse web websites and several uh, of the experts have enlisted uh, a small army of such social media helpers. The next slide. Uh, highlights that we are not alone in getting experts to help. The uh, Astronomical Society of the Pacific has given a NASA, has received rather a NASA grant uh, to train 500 Eclipse ambassador pairs. That is, they want to partner undergraduates with amateur astronomers and to train them to work in libraries and in other community groups to do community outreach. And so, um, Many of these pairs have already been trained, but they're hoping to train even more uh, for the April eclipse. So if you know an undergraduate this time around who's especially good at outreach and who's uh, open to learning more about eclipses and working with an amateur astronomer, uh, please contact the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. The next slide. Uh, they also have a new program just funded by NSF, which they call the Eclipse Stars Program, where they're uh, going to try to supplement our group of uh, science teachers and astronomers uh, to go out to libraries and other community groups. And they will provide glasses for these Eclipse Stars. They will provide training for them, virtual training. So again, if you have colleagues who are interested in helping, they can contact the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. The next slide uh, reminds us that there are already a group of early career astronomers called Astronomy Ambassadors of the American Astronomical Society. Uh, we've trained roughly 300 early career astronomers over the last 10 years to do outreach. There is a roster of them available through the AAS website. And uh, if you need someone or if you know a community group that needs someone to help, one place to find uh, astronomers ready to do outreach is the Astronomy Ambassadors webpage. The next slide uh, reminds us that NASA is very active in this field, I don't have time. That could be a whole other talk to tell you about all the exciting things that the NASA uh, HEAT program, H-E-A-T program, and other branches of NASA education and outreach are doing. But one place that's already getting quite involved in our project is the NASA Solar System Ambassadors. They've trained over 1,000 uh, people, most of them educators, amateur astronomers, to be outreach folks, and they've gotten very involved with the Eclipse outreach and with local libraries. Next slide. Um, while 6 million is a lot of safe viewing glasses, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the number of people who will see at least a partial eclipse. 
So we'll need to teach others safe ways to show the sun. And uh, particularly during the uh, annular eclipse and the uh, partial phases of the uh, other eclipse, it will be really important that everybody know how to protect themselves. And so the next slide leads us then into the second presentation. And if it's okay, I'm going to go through Dennis's presentation now, and then I'll be happy to take questions and uh, have people comment after both of them are over. Um, so NASA has uh, worked with educators, but there is a group of science educators at the National Science Teaching Association who are particularly getting involved with libraries and with the project I outlined in my talk. And so we want to talk a little bit about the work that the Moore Foundation is funding through the National Science Teaching Association. And Dennis Schatz, for those of you who don't know him, is a long-term, long-time veteran astronomy educator. His activities have been used all around the country. And he is, uh, we believe, the first astronomer ever to serve as president of the National Science Teaching Association. And so uh, this is his contribution, and he's really sorry that he can't be with you guys this morning. The next slide. Um, we uh, have uh, received funding to train 275 science teachers around the country through the National Science Teaching Association, and also to develop a web presence about the eclipse. Um, the uh, first call for such solar eclipse partners through NSTA uh, had to be shut down. The website had to be shut down after four hours because in just four hours after we announced it, we got double the number of partners that our initial grant could use. So then we went back to the foundation and we got double the number, even more than double the number of uh, uh, teachers funded. Uh, and so now we have room for a few more to fill in the 275. The next slide uh, shows you what we ask the Eclipse partners to do. We ask them to partner either with a library or community organization to do at least two public programs to make sure that they convey essential information about local circumstances, safe eclipse viewing, and a little bit about the science of what causes solar eclipses. And they need to provide not just these public programs, but also information to other teachers in their school and their district, and particularly to administrators. We'll talk about this in a minute, but many of you know that in 2017, science teachers planned for exciting activities, but then at the last minute, the administrators began to worry about insurance risk or other factors and absolutely forbade the students to go outside and deprive them of the eclipse experience, even in places where the eclipse was total. The next slide uh, shows you a few examples of what teachers are already doing at the Friends Central School in Wynwood, Pennsylvania. Uh, the students and the teacher have set up a Friends Central Moon Shadow team, uh, a pretty sophisticated website with uh, eclipse information. The next slide shows you the teacher whom you will recognize being in front of you. And so she'll say more about this, I think, in her part of the talk. The next slide, at the Stevenson School in Pacific Grove, California, the teacher has already done uh, seven different programs in anticipation of the October eclipse, including the public library, uh, through parents' conferences, at two boys and girls clubhouses, et cetera. So uh, like Angela Speck, she's an overachiever in this respect. The next slide shows you what's happening at Paul Duke's Dam High School in Dulles, Georgia. Uh, there are plans for uh, a wide range of hands-on activities to be undertaken by the teacher and the teacher's students. So these are just a few examples of the kind of things that the teachers are planning. The next slide shows you uh, the specifics of this. They will host an eclipse viewing event as part of a hidden sun festival serving the whole community. Uh, they will be, uh, they've already done an annual eclipse party at the public library and they're partnering 
with their community, including doing sun viewing. Uh, many uh, of the educators have a sun spotter or other appropriate solar telescope, and they can use that to show people the sun, uh, not just during the eclipse, but long before to get them a sense of what to look forward to and to understand the sun better. The next slide shows you something from 2017, but it's happening a lot this time too. Uh, a number of students have gotten money uh, from the school or from the parent-teacher organization to purchase an extra supply of Eclipse viewing glasses, and they were able to sell them or will be selling them at a small profit uh, to benefit the school or the science program. Uh, and this is something which the students take to be quite a bit of fun to be able to provide these glasses. and. Uh, uh, they often sell out uh, all the glasses that they can have. The next slide shows you uh, the effort we're doing on the web. So the NSTA has created its own Eclipse section of this website, which serves uh, thousands of uh, science teachers around the country. It's very easy to remember. It's just nsta.org forward slash Eclipse. And everything I'm going to show you in the next few slides uh, it comes from this uh, Eclipse uh, web section, which has a number of pages underneath that top page. The next slide shows you the booklets that have been put together. There is a booklet for teachers, a 28-page guide, which includes uh, many hands-on activities. There's a send home portion of that that we send, that we urge the the teachers to send home to families, particularly before this Saturday eclipse, which will not happen in school. And then there's a special booklet for administrators that I'll say a little bit more about at the end. The next slide, it, we have done a number of web seminars for science teachers and have others planned before April. These are available on the NSTA website and they provide basic information for those teachers who can't come uh, live to a presentation at an STA meeting. The next slide shows you two books that Dennis and I have published, one for children. Uh, both of these are through the nonprofit NSTA Press. There's a children's book where, where uh, grandparents are eclipse chasers, like many of you in the room, and they explain the eclipse and suggest some easy to do home activities that families can do to understand what eclipses are all about. Uh, Solar Science is a book of hands-on uh, middle school and early high school activities that teachers can do to help their students understand the moon, the sun, and eclipses, and many copies of these are in circulation. The next slide shows you that each of the journals, there are three journals from this NSTA organization for each level of science teaching. Each of them is having a special eclipse issue this past summer and uh, coming up uh, this month. And there will be articles uh, by us and by Charles Fulco and other educators about how to use eclipses for learning. The next slide, there's an entire collection of materials, by including those by NASA and by many of you, um, Pat Reif and others who are doing wonderful work creating educational resources. And you can go to that website and view the entire collection of Eclipse materials. Uh, the next slide. Uh, there also is a, a connector in, in the website to our uh, fellow organizations, including AAS, NASA, the National Informal STEM Education Network, and so on. So uh, there are links there so that uh, we don't hog all the intellectual space. The next slide shows you the administrator's guide uh, to finish up. Uh, the guide is a four-page guide for school administrators. It's a relatively easy read. They think we, we think that they have much uh, all else on their mind. So we wanted to make this concise and to the point. And we make three points to the administrators uh, and the teachers are encouraged to send this to the administrators and to make these points. The three points we make are, next slide. Uh, and we want to make sure that they get the information early so that they can themselves in their head make plans. 
And the three things we administer, we want them to know, the administrators to know, is that eclipses are a wonderful learning experience. They bring home to the students concepts that the national standards require them to know. The next slide. That eclipses are safe to view. We give them some background information. For example, that at the UK eclipse a few years ago, there was a good study uh, by eye doctors, uh, and they were not able to document any recorded cases of permanent visual loss. That the cries of people are going to burn their eyes out are probably a little bit exaggerated. Uh, the next slide then finishes by showing that there are many other ways to observe an eclipse safely, even if you run out of glasses. And I want to end with Dennis's and my favorite, which is, I know many of you know this, but make sure others do as well, that if you just take a regular home colander and hold it over your shoulder with your back to the sun, you can project a wonderful pinhole projector set of images showing you an artfully arranged set of eclipse uh, views. And the, just the fact that you stand outside with a colander over your shoulder is sure to attract attention from your neighbors and friends and make you the center of eclipse learning for your community. So we encourage you, even if you have friends and colleagues in the partial eclipse zones, to make sure that they're fully equipped to share the wonderful experience of eclipses. And I believe that's the last slide. That's right. So I'm happy to have comments and discussion and thank you for your attention. I think we're gonna wait just a little bit for comments uh, until after uh, the next couple of presenters, if you don't mind hanging on there, Andy. Thanks. Um, of course, so now we actually, this is the perfect follow on to Andy's uh, slide. We can't wait to hear about your experience, Deborah. Thank you so much. Um, remind me with this this thing, I click the side plus button to advance. Uh, the one with, the little... with the plus. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start with the, let me see if I'm aiming at this. Nope. Aiming at you. Nope. I'm not doing it right. I think Andrew has to click one place. Yeah, sorry, up. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah, there's too much on there. Well, I have some like quotes and stuff all over the screen, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So today I'm just going to talk about whoops, is this it not working? Nope. There we go. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Yes. I wasn't sure this way, this way. All right. Sorry. So who am I? Why am I here? I'm going to talk about that. Then come on, I'm still clicking and not going. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Motivation for the project, what teachers want. I'll talk to you a little bit about my summer journey um, along the path challenges and suggestions moving ahead. And at the end, I guess we'll have time for questions. So my name is Deborah Skapik. I've been doing astronomy outreach for 30 years. I started my career in research astrophysics at the University of Hawaii's Institute for Astronomy, studying colliding galaxies and clusters, not solar eclipses, but along the way realized that my passion was really in taking the lofty ideas I was learning and making them accessible to everyone from Girl Scouts to senior citizens. While still doing PhD research with telescopes on Mauna Kea, I accepted a job at Williams College, working as Jay Pasikoff's observatory supervisor, thus giving myself quite possibly the longest commute in history. Um, while there, I helped Jay pack up his two tons of equipment for eclipse expeditions in Chile and India, and learned a lot about eclipse outreach. Fueled by this, I ran my own outreach trip to the island of St. Kitts in February 1998, visiting six schools with my orange C8, as you can see in the bottom, um, in the days leading up to totality. Since that time, I've continued to teach and run public programs in the Philadelphia area, from the University of Pennsylvania to the three schools where I now teach, 
by day in a high school, online at a community college, and by night at St. Joseph's University. This year, I became one of the NASA partner Eclipse ambassadors through the ASP program, as well as a SEAL, yes, shout out, <laughs> as a SEAL solar eclipse expert. And most of these photos are from this summer, where I was working to spread eclipse literacy to educators, which is what I'm here to talk with you about. In summer of 2017, I ran a week-long summer science academy in observational astronomy at Friends Central in southeastern Pennsylvania, where I prepared eight high school students and two middle schoolers, you can see them up there, for the August 21st solar eclipse. We traveled to South Carolina not only to get in totality, but so that these students could practice what they had learned, such as teaching others in workshops to make pinhole viewers out of cereal boxes and giving impressive public slideshows. On the big day, the Moonshadow team was out in Smith Park on Daniel Island, shout out to Daniel Island, enjoying the eclipse for themselves and assisting residents in the press to equip their cameras with filters, look through the telescopes and more. These students were equipped to do this because their teacher, me, was equipped to teach them to. But in the following years, I've heard disappointing to tragic stories from people about what they were doing during the eclipse. Many of these stories have come from the students, mostly at the community college, where I teach. Either they did not know the eclipse was happening or were told to fear it and not look at all. Even more heartbreaking for me is hearing that some teachers decided not to offer their classes the chance to see that eclipse, whether partial or total, because they were not prepared to teach about it. This phantom of fearful, uninformed teachers stuck with me. For the 2024 eclipse and 2023 for that matter, I resolved to do what I could to get as many teachers eclipse literate and by reaching them to get their students outside looking up. So what do teachers want? When K-12 teachers are asked to do things naturally, we want training. This is tricky though, because there never seems to be enough time in the day or year for this. The academic year is brimming. At one moment, you're in the classroom experiencing contact hours, and if you're not doing that, you're prepping or grading stuff or in meetings or in parent conferences or at home being a zombie after all that activity. Time is precious. So teachers really want resources. Books or workbooks or even internet sites they can go to reflexively without having to cobble together things for themselves. There are, of course, resources out there, excellent resources like the ASP's Eclipse Stars program or the Solar Science Book by Andy and Dennis Schatz. But a big struggle is getting these materials into the hands of teachers when they need these resources and getting the word out about the training with enough lead time. If teachers do have time to go to a training, I learned that teachers want to get PD credits for what hours they spend there. Many states, maybe all states, require that educators holding certification to teach in the public schools participate in ongoing professional education to maintain their certification. For example, Pennsylvania's Act 48, established in 1999, requires that every five years, teachers, those busy teachers, complete the equivalent of six collegiate credits or 180 hours of professional development. Remember, this is on top of an already crammed schedule. Lastly, teachers need resources and are more than likely spending money out of their own pockets to purchase classroom supplies. They appreciate any and all materials that can be used and reused to help educate students. Over summer 2022, I wrote a workbook for K-12 teachers with the April 8th, 2024 eclipse in mind and made a plan to get it into the hands of teachers. Look up below is not a long book, but it contains just enough cool stuff and science information for teachers to understand the three basic conditions that must be met for a total eclipse, moon at new phase, at a node and near perigee with a glossary defining technical terms. There is a how-to chapter on indirect and direct viewing of eclipses, a chapter noting a few important historical eclipses, and one on indigenous perspectives. But the heart of the book is its activity pages. Those I have organized by age appropriateness, primary, middle, secondary, and have designed to be duplicated and given to students. In other words, when April rolls around and teachers wonder, what can I do to teach my students about the eclipse? All they need to do 
is run the appropriate hands-on activities with their students and use the rest of the book as a reference for viewing instructions and more. To get this book into the hands of educators hasn't been easy. This summer, I traveled along the Northeast part of the Eclipse Path in an effort to distribute it to as many teachers as possible. A donor from my school funded part of the book printing costs so I could give away some copies freely to teachers in Title I eligible schools. Over one week at the end of July, beginning of August, I visited nine public libraries in four different states, giving away 77 books and selling just a handful. At most of the locations, I gave a slideshow with a talk, did a Q&A and demos. Some places were very receptive to the eclipse, are excited about it and are preparing for it. Other places are concerned because the timing places it smack dab in the middle of dismissal time and school administrators are trying to figure out what to do about transportation. And some towns are just wishing the eclipse would go away because they remember what a problem it was in 2017 and have already canceled school for April 8th so they don't have to deal with it. One library in Indiana where not a single educator came to my event told me that. If you have questions about how I set up the logistics for the journey, I'd be happy to answer them during the question time. We still have a lot of work to do. Don't let this mess keep happening. We need to educate the educators. The struggle to reach the educators is real, but surmountable, I think. There are a few things I think we can focus on. How to reach the teachers. Public libraries do seem to be willing partners generally. SEAL is working with them to reach communities, but I think we could also go, th go through them to do events this winter focused specifically on educators. How to entice teachers. Two things. First, provide professional development credits and give away stuff. It may sound silly, but I want to reiterate that teacher time is precious. In one location this summer, the library did a really great job at advertising my event to the teachers and tempted them away from summer vacation time by promising them that they'd be getting a free book. These teachers also asked me and the librarian directly if they could get PD credits for the workshop. And the librarian took down names and email addresses promising to look into it. If someone in each state could do this and make that information available to Eclipse educators like us, in other words, how to make the workshops we are giving count for this kind of credit, I think that could help. Lastly, the more resources we can give to the teachers, supply kits like the ASP has, Yardstick Eclipse, copies of resources like this book, Andy and Dennis's book and stuff, the better. The ASP Eclipse Stars is great for this. Um, so let's spread the word about it. Thank you very much. Okay, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. We're going to need a minute to bring Charles Fulco online, present here, and his presentation as well. So just a few moments. Okay, Charles, unmute yourself. You can do it. Can't hear you though. Okay, got there it. There we go. Okay. <sighs> okay, let me know when I can start. Deb. You can start, Charles. Thank you, Deb. Anyway, um, thank you for letting me take a break from uh, flushing out my mother's um, basement with flood water. I appreciate this. <laughs> anyway, uh, I wish I could be there with everybody, um, but unfortunately school's a little busy this time of year and then I'm taking off time in two weeks for the eclipse in Santa Fe. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to just see everybody virtually. Um, this is something that's brand new and it's only been a week and it's a very rough uh, PowerPoint. Um, presentation, so I apologize for the uh, roughness of it, but I, I wanted to share something that I did um, over the past six months, actually, but actually 
took form and shape. It came to a nice uh, reality last weekend when I visited uh, a large prison system in um, Houston, uh, just outside of Houston, Texas, in a town called Richmond. Uh, back in April, I was thinking that uh, uh, you could go ahead to the next slide. I was thinking that. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Oh God, go ahead. This was the wrong code. Sorry. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Next one. I sent you the wrong one. Okay, one more, one more. Okay, um, back in April, I was thinking about all the um, uh, logistics to get uh, you know, administrators and principals and even science chairs on board from my experiences in 2017. And I was thinking that um, something mentioned, uh, next slide, somebody had mentioned this, a couple of schools even went into lockdown, next slide. And I was thinking, I don't know. It's, I'm sorry. I, it's, I sent you the wrong presentation. I mean, the incomplete one. Uh, anyway, I was thinking to myself that uh, we always deal with uh, eclipses from a regular ed point of view. And I got to thinking, what would it be like if we could actually have a um, uh, students who are not part of the regular ed crowd? And I'm thinking even further, maybe uh, juvenile detention centers, maybe um, uh, prison systems. So what happened was I got in touch with, uh, I just went on, on Google basically, I did a prison search in Texas because uh, Texas was close to the you know X marks the spot with the two eclipses. And I realized that there was this huge uh, prison system called uh, Wyndham. And Wyndham uh, extends from all the way south to the, uh, up to the Panhandle, west to El Paso and, and east. And um, I figured I gotta have a good chance there. So I just spun the wheel, came up with uh, Jester because I thought the name was kind of interesting. And uh, I reached out to this principal uh, named Jenna who uh, was kind of reticent and she was uh, kind of what we'd say a tough cookie at first. And uh, the more I spoke with her, I was kind of tenacious as she calls it. And she started thinking this could be a really good PR for the prison as well as getting the, the um, inmates out. Uh, side and uh, actually seeing something as uh, I called it eclipse therapy. Uh, they don't get out very much. And I have some photos to show you in a second to show you what it actually looks like. So we talked and talked and talked and she's, well, you know, I'm kind of sold on this now, but what about, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, uh, maybe pushback from above and there's going to be, um, you know, lots of uh, bureaucratic red tape to go through and things like that. So uh, we decided to give, give it a try. And, uh, May came, June came, no word from above. Finally, uh, by July, we had a uh, uh, the warden okayed it, but he said, of course, you have to go up through the channels up to the state level. So he took over, because now he became a fan of this idea. And between Jana and the warden, um, by the end of August, we had permission for me to come down uh, anytime, as soon as we got clearance from um, the uh, public relations people, because of course I wanted to take some pictures and video. And then we had a um, Deb had uh, nicely put me in touch with a um, documentary uh, person from New York City, and he got interested. So um, uh, we had to get permission for that. So uh, if you ever want to do something like this, I'm discovering six months is a minimum probably for for lead time. So once we got everything okayed, I went down last weekend, uh, flew out uh, right after school ended on Thursday, and uh, spent the weekend with the uh, the crew. And I learned. Hold on one second. I'm on a Zoom. I'm on a Zoom. Yeah. Um, sorry. So uh, we got there and I had to go through the um, the same routine that staff does um, coming in. The, the Not quite a strip search, but, you know, bringing in my license and uh, uh, not much else. They even confiscated my phone. But luckily, um, the warden and Jenna took uh, video and, and photos, which I'm going to show you real quick. Um, so the, I have to say the in, the inmates, as or I like to call them the students, because they truly are students, um, had a wonderful time with me. We bonded uh, relatively quickly over the three days uh, to the point where um, they were actually sad to see me go on Monday. I brought in uh, as much resources as I could. Uh, they don't have internet access there, so we had to download everything onto our respective laptops. Uh, and uh, so things were very, um, like very, <laughs> experienced what it's like to be locked down, basically. Uh, uh, some of these people were in there for, you know, over 10 years, and they see one hour of daylight, if that much a day. Uh, so this, uh, the uh, idea of the eclipse was uh, 
like a fantastic idea for them is, and they're treating it like a positive reward for the uh, the inmates. If you could uh, go ahead to the next um, slide, please. Okay, so, um, oh, no, go back one, you had it. Go back just one, thanks you, okay. So I'm realizing uh, that when I went to the prison last weekend, I really felt like there was an education desert going on there. We talk about food deserts and, and uh, landscape deserts, but there was a true education desert going on. Uh, the library was not really well stocked. It wasn't very well attended. I brought some books with me, which they now put, gladly put in the library. Um, and I realized the more I was there that these these students, a lot of them were kids. I taught from a 18 to 80, literally. And uh, the oldest um, person was just as interested as the youngest person. There was only three people that opted out out of an entire cell block. I thought that was amazing. So there is truly a need and a want and a craving actually for education behind behind prison walls. Um, they promised me the the uh, students would be taken out to a courtyard. I have a photo of that coming up too. Uh, and that's the only place they're allowed to to uh, view from. And they're actually going to take uh, a f uh, some of the fences and tall um, things away to that would might block the view. I mean, it won't really, but they're really into this. So the um, the uh, courtyard is going to become um, their eclipse viewing point, and they're going to be allowed out for 30 minutes on either side of both maximum um, uh, coverage. Uh, unfortunately, Jester is outside the path of annularity and totality, so they're going to get about 92% and 94% respectively partial, so uh, they're quite excited about that. Uh, next slide. Uh, Deb, um, I'm sorry, what's my time on this? How much time do I have left? Excuse me? You got five big minutes, Charles. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, I, I, this went over so well that I'm thinking uh, I am gonna uh, take this and run with it. I'm gonna approach other um, uh, alternative uh, learning centers like uh, juvenile detention centers where I, I, I have tutored at. Uh, school for, St. Mary's School for the Deaf in Buffalo, that's gonna be my first attempt at a school for the deaf. If that goes over well, I will uh, take that and run with it also. Um, and again, I, while I was a little bit nervous going in on that, that uh, the first morning, uh, within, I'd say, a half hour, it was evident that I was welcomed there by the warden on down to the cafeteria workers wanted to come out and see what was going on. The librarian, of course, was there, uh, the, the phys ed person. It, it's like everything, everything revolved around what I was doing in that little small teaching space, and it was really, really nice. Uh, so the, the, um, the inmates, the, the incarcerated students, they are going to have permission to see what somebody in a, in a park would see, uh, you know, obviously with not surrounded Bob barbed wire and, and uh, guard towers. So it's a little bit different, but the fact is they're going to see these things. And not only are the prisoners, I hate this, I keep saying prisoners, these students thrilled. Um, so is everybody else at Jester. And they are actually encouraging me to, to go around to other, uh, you know, prisons within the state. But I think I'm going to follow along the path of totality, head, head north from Texas and find major prisons like Terre Haute, Indiana uh, and other places that are with, actually within the path. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, I just spoke with about this before. We have to be aware that uh, it's okay to uh, push your limits. And I, I, my principal, when I got back to, to Brooklyn on, uh, on uh, Tuesday, uh, said he was really proud uh, that I um, you know, uh, went out of my comfort zone and he asked me to speak to the teachers at the faculty meeting on Wednesday. And uh, we talked about going out of your comfort zone and that's exactly where I was. But you know what? I feel like I rode this high afterwards uh, from that. And it's it's giving me a, a real good lesson on how to, uh, you know, kind of go into places you never would have thought of before for not only for eclipses, but for other types of learning. Next slide. And again, the, we know about the whole weight, but especially for incarcerated um, students, and this kind of came up, which I didn't even think about, but incarcerated people, they, they can't travel to see an eclipse. So the fact that these two eclipses are coming to their area um, is, is uh, astounding, you know, within six months of each other. And I didn't even think of that, that they have really no mobility to go from one place to another. So this is actually super special, extra special for them. Uh, next slide. Okay, again, same thing, uh, advance, 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 <laughs> notice, uh, educate in advance and every, uh, and, and uh, uh, get, get your, if you choose to do something like this, get your, uh, the red tape taken care of, 
um, get get your all all your uh, OKs from uh, you know the top level in the state on down. And there are so many discrete channels of bureaucracy in a prison system that I had no idea. Um, Deb, is there a way I could share my? Because um, I realized I sent you the wrong one. Uh, slideshow wasn't complete. Can I can I share my screen to show you the the photographs? I'm not sure. Oh, um, Give it a whirl. See if you can. Okay, share screen. Okay. Oh, for, you know what? No, it's going to be, forget it. Um, anyway, what I'll do is I'll post these uh, somehow. Great. Yeah, yeah, perfect. In fact, wh when you send us, send us the right one uh, so that yeah. that's what we'll, the right slide shows, so that's what we'll post with the video when we put it online for everyone. I'll send it to you right now because it's done. I just, I just sent you, in my confusion with this crazy storm, I, I, didn't I sent you the wrong one? So I'll send you the proper one, and you can you can just sounds it. good. But anyway, okay. thank you guys. Sorry, it's been thank a day. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye, guys. Okay, so um, now it is especially important if we're going to be asking questions from the audience. Uh, you need to use the mic. So uh, we have one over there, and I'll come around over here uh, to help out. So Rick Yames has a question, as does Letitia. Okay, here I come. Hey, Charles. Hey. You were supposed to be here, what happened? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Okay, hey, quick question. Um, I was just wondering if you were, had any contact, did any work with the Northwest State Correctional Facility in St. Albans, Vermont? Um, the reason I ask that is I want to connect with you on that because they have the center line of the TSE goes right through their facility. Oh, that's very cool to know. I did not know. Let me, I'm writing that down as you speak. It's uh, NWSCF, Northwest State Correctional Facility. And I'm working with the Sherwin Williams paint distributor to actually paint or designate the center line, but I could use your help because that's sure. a captive audience and I, I could use your help. Yeah, I think now that I got this this weekend under my belt, it was a real learning experience. And I think I'll be much more fluent going along with prisons now. So we'll be in touch, Rick, definitely. Hi, everybody. I think everybody knows who I am. Letitia Ferrer, seen 20 eclipses. It's my passion. I'm gonna see everyone till the I'm gonna see everyone in the planet until I die. Deborah, how do I get certified to give Texas PDUs or who is somebody in the room can help me do that. I would love to do the workshops. All I have is a bachelor's. I know I'm in a room full of PhDs. Um, all I have is a bachelor's, but I done training before, but I would love to be able to, to host in the local libraries, your material to teach teachers and then get them the PDU credits. Who can help me with that? Yeah, that's, that's the part that I'm not sure about. And I would love people to research that I'm, a, I'm, I teach three different places and I'm running this 27 kid moon shadow team. I have like zero time to sleep. So I don't know how to research that. And if someone at NSTA someone in the or some, let me, let me, let me see if I can jump in. Um, Please. So generally speaking, uh, the professional development units are given through institutions of higher learning. So, for example, where I am in San Francisco, San Francisco State University is a big provider of such units. So one thing you could do is to link up with someone at a university or college who is an eclipse enthusiast or a science outreach enthusiast, and they can arrange uh, for you to be included in a program that they do with their credentials. And then that uh, institution of higher learning can give professional development units. That's probably okay. the easiest setup way you could have given the short time is to use an existing provider of such units. Okay. You can also contact the state uh, licensing and so on, but that's that's going to take you a lot longer than the yeah. time we have. I'd rather partner with somebody. I would rather right. partner with somebody who has an existing license who had no understands everything else but be able to do that thank you for that i will reach out and to ask, i'll probably reach out to the dallas college teacher, ask a teacher locally where they get their units and then that can okay die. okay thank you 
Hey, uh, Vivian White here from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Hi, y'all. Um, Charles, I have a question for you. We are also working with some of the um, correctional facilities in Ohio, and we've been trying to connect the families of prisoners with, uh, uh, with the eclipse as well so that they have an experience that they can do on the inside and the outside together because there are not many of those that happen. I was wondering if you had considered something like that. I actually Thanks. forgot to mention that. They actually, the prison already... Um, uh, did that <laughs> they took a liberty of doing that so families will be coming uh it's going to be a you know saturday visitation anyway so they're actually going to going to have the families in the court the same courtyard as the uh as the um, inmates so uh i'd like to work with you on that maybe we could streamline the system and come up with a real a real um you know kind of template to do something like this to expedite you know permissions and things like that with families i would i would love that yeah i think just the so everyone knows expedite. vivian is the person who is running the Eclipse Ambassadors program at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So please talk to her if you want to know more about what they're doing. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Other questions? Comments? Okay. Yeah. I think you need the microphone. Here, here you go. Deborah, how do I get copies of the workbook? Uh, so for folks who are here, I have a couple copies that I can can get to you in my backpack. Um, folks that are not here, I am selling it on Shopify or if people email me um, and I guess that information email addresses are just, you, you could talk to me. Um, Title One teachers, what I'm doing is I'm shipping it out just for the cost of the shipping and then other people are purchasing it. So just see me after. We link to we link to your book from the uh, books and articles page of our website eclipse.aas.org, so people can find the book and find you through that. Yes, and I have little slips of paper with the li the Shopify link on it that I can hand out to people too. But thanks, Rick, for linking to it. There we go. Uh, Deborah, are, are teachers uh, afraid of being sued? Is that why they're not teaching this or wanting the children to go outside? <laughs> I think in some cases that is what people said to me this summer. Um, they, they're they concerned about litigation, but I think other cases it's just, just lack of information and they don't know the way to teach about this, like what material to teach. They don't have the content knowledge and then there's there's a difference, of course, between knowing about eclipses and teaching about eclipses. And so to have on hand recommendations for activities to do for age appropriate, because you can't be talking about nodes with kindergartners, <coughs> but they can understand shadows. Other comments? No? Okay, can we thank our presenters, please? Andy Fracknoy, Charles Volko. Deborah Scaffick.